Happy World Ocean Day! Greetings from Alabama! Hope everyone is doing well out there. Uh, my name is Brian Dwankowski. I'm a professor at the University of South Alabama um, and a researcher at Dolphin Island Sea Lab. Uh, I'm a physical oceanographer and so my World Ocean Day talk is going to focus on the physics of the ocean um, and how the physics and it's going to relate to ecosystems and conservation through the processes that physics drive, right? So fish and animals live in a physical environment. And so understanding that physical environment is going to relate to their ecosystem and their ability to survive in that ecosystem. And so my talk today is going to be focused on hurricanes and heat waves, right? And you might say that doesn't sound very oceany, right? Hurricanes and heat waves, that those are atmospheric processes. What is this guy doing? Well, there's two things going on here. One, hurricanes and heat waves are tied to the ocean. And so fundamentally, these processes are linked to the ocean. So World Ocean Day is sort of demonstrating how the ocean influences everything in the Earth's system. And so while I'm talking about atmospheric processes, they directly tie to the ocean. Two, I'm being a bit coy. Uh, so when I say heat waves, I'm not just talking about terrestrial or atmospheric heat waves. I'm going to be talking about marine heat waves. So just like land um, terrestrial environments have heat waves, the ocean have heat waves. And so I'm going to be talking about this coupling between hurricanes, atmospheric heat waves, and marine heat waves. And so we're going to bring this all back into the ocean. And so the title may not seem ocean orientated, but this is very much rooted in, in, in ocean science. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so the, the talk is going to be focused on, on extreme events, right? And so why do we care about extreme events? And, and just as sort of a, uh, a background, you know, this is Hurricane Michael, which we're going to be talking about quite a bit. So this is um, the, the, the major system that hit the Florida Panhandle in 2018. Uh, we're going to talk quite a bit about this system, but um, it's representative of extreme events. And so why do we care about extreme events? Well. Extreme events are very important for, they're very important tests for the resiliency of natural and anthropogenic systems, right? So um, big events disproportionately cause lots of damage. So it's not the little storms that do a lot of damage. It's the big ones that do way more damage than the little ones. And so that, those are the ones we really care about. Those are the events we really care about. Um, in addition to that, in and of themselves being damaging extreme events when coupled with existing environmental conditions or long-term trends can synergetically create big problems right so if you combine a extreme event with a global warming or eutrophication in a system you can dramatically shift the characteristics of that system when these when these long-term trends are coupled with an extreme event um, they're also very important for assessing risk and vulnerability of areas. If you're not getting, if you don't know, understand the extreme events in your system, you don't really fundamentally understand the risk and vulnerability of different areas and different developments um, to these extreme conditions. And so um, in the coastal areas where we have growing populations, we have expanding infrastructure, and we have stressed ecosystems, understanding extreme events is very important. And so one major extreme event that happens in many coastal areas throughout the tropics and, and, and temperate uh, latitudes are tropical storms, right? So tropical storms are significant systems that can cause significant loss of life and property damage. And so we really want to get a handle on them. And what we're learning is that, you know, it's, it's understanding this pro these processes when tropical storms get to extreme states in continental shelf areas, in the coastal areas, where they're likely to make landfall is really important, right? So a lot of work has been done in the open ocean, but these systems don't really impact coastal ecosystems and human development in the open ocean, to some extent, right? There are, gulf, there are rigs in the Gulf that get damaged by open ocean hurricanes, but a lot of coastal areas. So understanding how these systems uh, uh, operate and how they could potentially intensify on continental shelves is a, is a really important question to get to get at. And so there's, there has been some work in this area. Um, so there's some, been some limited work that suggests um, because the, the, the heat content of, ocean, uh, of, of oceans is much greater than shelves, continental shelves are not really a great, uh, they don't have a lot of amplification potential. Other work has suggested the stratification on shelves can lead to a mitigation of storms as they make landfall. 
And then on the other hand, there's some contradictory evidence that says um, these, because of their shallow depth, there's not a lot of cold water on shelves, and so they can be a source of amplification. They can be an area that, that, that may amplify hurricanes. And so there's a lot of uncertainty as to, to how hurricanes are going to respond in the shelf environment. And so the question is, it's, it's a connection between the ocean and the atmosphere. And, and what links those two things? Well, in this case, it's sea surface temperature. So what we really want to understand is how is sea surface temperature changing in the coastal environment? And that's going to be directly coupled to the water column structure. So how the temperature is structured through the water column is going to affect how the sea surface changes. And how that sea surface changes, the sea surface temperature changes, is going to be how it feeds energy to tropical cyclones, right? So let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail, right? So we have a, a figure here where we have sort of the open ocean and the continental shelf. And fundamentally, there's, a, there's a, a big difference here where at the bottom here in the open ocean, you have an infinite cold reserve. And on a continental shelf, there's a bottom that limits how much mixing the upper ocean can, can affect, um, how, much, how much deep water mixing can, can influence the upper ocean. And so, um, there's this difference between the open ocean and continental shelves. And so how does the ocean, how does the ocean interact with the tropical cyclone? Well, it principally does this in two ways. It does this through heat flux, so surface heat flux. So there's water evaporating. Um, there's water evaporating off the surface of the ocean. That's the sort of big arrow. That feeds the storm. There's also a temperature difference between the ocean and the atmosphere. And so there's also heat transferred from the ocean to the atmosphere through this temperature difference, right? So heat flux is one way in which the sea surface temperature communicates, the ocean communicates with the, with the, uh, the, the tropical storm. But another way in which the sea surface temperature changes is through mixing, right? So big storms have big winds and big waves, and that's effectively mixing the ocean. And so you take warm surface water and you mix it downward, you pull bottom water upward, and that cools the upper ocean, that cools the sea surface temperature, and so that's typically going to um, de-intensify a storm. So understanding the vertical structure and how that vertical structure mixes may be quite important, right? So we have these two factors, surface heat flux and mixing. Those two things affect the sea surface temperature. That's sort of imaged up top here. There's mixing and then there's heat flux. Um, and so, as it turns out, mixing is really the dominant mechanism that controls how, how the sea surface of the ocean communicates with the, with the storm, right? So, the fact that mixing is the dominant way in which sea surface temperatures change means that on the shelf versus the open ocean, where we have an infinite cold reserve in the ocean and a bom bottom limitation on the shelf, the ability of the, of the storm to mix cold water is sig significantly inhibited when you're on a continental shelf because you can't mix through the bottom. You're just stuck at the bottom. There's no more cold water coming up. And so there's this, this limitation in how much cold water can be mixed up. And so that suggests that these continental shelves may be really important or have the potential to amplify storms because you don't have this cold reserve that can de-intensify a storm, right? And so that's really what's going to, that's really what leads into the objectives and hypothesis of this talk. It's how, what conditions set up hydrographic or temperature structures in the ocean that are, or on the, on the continental shelf that influence and amplify tropical cyclones. So the overall goal of, the, of this talk really is to improve the understanding of, of the sequence of events that lead to favorable hydrographic conditions, so the temperature structure in, in the coastal ocean that lead to, to favorable conditions for amplification. And we're going to put this hypothesis for, forth that may sound a little strange, but hopefully will become clearer as we, as we look through the data, right? The hypothesis that we're going to be working off is that strong mixing events, so things like tropical systems, followed by atmospheric heat waves, uh, are going to be conducive to priming the ocean for extreme tropical storms, right? And so this is motivated by observational evidence that we'll look at and we'll hope, um, at least in the case of Hurricane Michael, uh, proved out to be very important. And so um, 
We're going to be focusing on the Mississippi bite in the fall of 2018, where we have a, a long history of data uh, and we have environmental data during the extreme event of Hurricane Michael before and during. Um, and so this is a really good to, to look at uh, this extreme coastal event, uh, uh, Hurricane Michael, basically, uh, during, during um, the, fall, the fall transition, basically, the fall season. So if we look at the data that we have, right? So here's a plot of the Mississippi Bight area for those that may not be familiar with it. Um, we have Dolphin Island Sea Lab right here. Um, you have Pensacola Beach right here. Uh, the magenta line there is where Hurricane Michael made landfall. And the red line is where Tropical Storm Gordon came across and made landfall. And we'll get to, to Gordon in a little bit. It's a, it, it's a fundamental uh, part of the story. Um, but we're just going to focus on the data right now. And so what we're really going to be using is temporal data from this mooring site that Dolphin Island Sea Lab has been, has been maintaining for the better part of 15 years. Um, so this is that CP station. And this is what it looks like. There's this little buoy offshore, um, and that's marking a whole bunch of instruments in the water where we have, we're collecting data on temperature, salinity, um, currents, a whole bunch of things throughout the water column. And we've been doing that for years and years and years. Um, and that this stuff was in the water prior to Hurricane Michael, as well as during um, uh, Tropical Storm Gordon. So we have this really nice time series of data through the whole water column during this event. So we can really look at how the temperature structure changes over the course of this event. Um, we're also going to look at some spatial data using satellite data. We're going to be using this stuff called SST, so that's sea surface temperature, and SSS, which is sea surface salinity. Um, so if you see those, those uh, acronyms, that's it's sea surface temperature and sea surface salinity. And then we're also going to be coupling this observational data with a very simple numerical model. Uh, it's just a 1D model. Uh, it's just a 1D model where you just have a vertical water column and you force it with wind conditions and heat flux, surface heat flux conditions, and and you have mixing at the bottom. And so it's basically um, a vertical layer that that's forced by winds and and surface fluxes, right? And this is sort of what it looks like uh, conceptually. And um, yeah, we'll be using that model to to confirm what we're seeing in the observations. So if we look at what was happening during the fall of 2018, um, we had a really big storm, right? Hurricane Michael, as I mentioned. This is a crazy storm, right? This thing was massive, right? So this is sort of an image from uh, weather.com. You can see this really clear eye. This was a, a, a you know, very, very powerful storm. It was the strongest hurricane on record to make landfall in the Florida Panhandle. Um, even more interesting is that um, it experienced rapid intensification through landfall, which is pretty unusual. It was the latest um, landfall Category 5 hurricane in the U.S. It caused $25 billion worth of damage. I think it took about 16 lives. Um, so this thing was, was devastating for property and, and loss of life. And what was really wild about the storm is the predictions were persistently under forecast casting its intensity, right? So this is a plot of, of selected hurricane models and their, their trajectory uh, for the intensity of the storm versus the observed trajectory of the storm, right? So the y-axis, we have intensity in, in knots, so that's wind speed. And then on the x-axis, we have time. This is October 7th, October 9th, October 11th, um, going sort of towards landfall. And what you can see here is the intensity of Hurricane Michael over time. The black line with the circles, or, or the hurricane icons, are the intensity of Hurricane Michael. And you can see it's increasing as it, as it heads towards land, as it, as it heads towards the 10th when it made landfall. And the blue lines are these intensity projections. So at each dot, a model does a forecast for what it thinks the conditions of the storm are going to be in the future. And what you can see is the blue lines are almost always underneath the black line. So this means the projection, the model projection, is under forecasting the intensity. Why might that be bad? Well, if you're planning for a storm landfall and you're saying it's going to be weaker than it turns out to be, you may get people who stay in their houses, you may get people who don't board up their, their property properly and just don't take the right precautions. And so that's going to lead to a loss of life, loss of property. And so in general, it's a dangerous thing to be under forecasting a, a tropical system. Um, there's also issues with over forecasting, right? So we really want to be right, but it's hard to be right. Uh, these are very complicated systems. 
Um, but so this thing, this thing is, it was in, it, the intensity on this thing was under forecasted. And, and what really struck me was this intensification as it made landfall, right? And so the fact that it intensified as it came across the continental shelf sort of suggested that the, the, the heat content on the shelf might be playing a role. The temperature structure might be playing a role in the intensification of this event, right? So if we look at what was happening at that time, so this is a time series of depth average temperatures from the focal mooring. So this is the little triangle here is where this data is coming from. This again, this is the Mississippi Bight. We have Dolphin Island Sea Lab right there. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to see plots like this for um, a, a little bit. So I'll just introduce you to them. In general, we have time from August 19th to um, October 14th. Um, the y-axis is depth average temperature. It, it may change depending on what variable we're looking at. Uh, and then well, you can see a whole bunch of lines here. The thin black line is the mean, the long-term mean. The gray shading is two standard deviations away from that mean. And the black dash line is the maximum observed value at that location on that given day, right? And the, or that given hour, really. The red line is the observed conditions uh, in 2018. So when M Hurricane Michael was influencing the area, that's what that red line is. It's the observed conditions in 2018. And what you can see here is, and then you have sort of a hash here for where hur when Hurricane Michael hit landfall, right? So this is where Hurricane Michael hit landfall. And what you can see here is the red line is overlaying the black dashed line. So that black dashed line is the maximum observed value for depth average temperature on that given day or that given hour. And that overlaps the red line. So this means in 2018, the observed value was setting the maximum value observed in this 13-year time series. So this is what's known as a, a, a marine heat wave. So the area uh, offshore of Dolphin Island was experiencing an extensive heat wave prior to my, Hurricane Michael's arrival. And so this would mean this is a, a time when you might expect the ocean to be amplifying a tropical storm or a hurricane. And so the next question is, so this is sort of consistent with Michael intensifying before landfall. And so the next question is, how did that come to be, right? So what set up this extreme event, this, ex this extreme marine heat wave? Well, really, there's two big humps here where you see the heat content, the depth average increase. You see this first one, oops, wrong way. You see this first increase here uh, in early uh, September. And then you see another slower, longer one happening in mid-September, right? So what was going on during these two significant increases that, that pushes us into this extreme condition here prior to Hurricane Michael? Well, the first event was triggered by a tropical storm, Tropical Storm Gordon. So Tropical Storm Gordon comes through here, and this is a satellite image, and you can see its track is pretty far from Hurricane Michael. So the purple is Hurricane Michael, the red is Tropical Storm Gordon. And if you just look at those two tracks, you might say, well, they're not very close together. But if you look at the satellite image of, of the storm, you can see that that storm, that storm pattern uh, covers the area that Michael, um, where Michael made landfall, right? So you see this area influencing the broader uh, Mississippi Bight area. And so the processes that might be happening at, at CP likely affecting the whole area. Um, we'll talk more about that later, but you definitely see a tropical storm come through. And what does that tropical storm do? Well, it mixes up the ocean. Right, so if we look at a time series of temperature, so this is the temperature structure at the mooring. So we're again at this, at this focal mooring, right? That's sort of the mooring, uh, sort of this look right there, uh, that cartoon. Um, and what you see is time on the bottom, August to October, the hash here, uh, the triangle is Hurricane Michael landfall. And then we also added a hash here for Tropical Storm Gordon landfall, right? And what you see here is initially, in August, the water is highly stratified. You have warm water up top, very cold water at depth, and Hurricane Michael comes through, or excuse me, Tropical Storm Gordon comes through, and it mixes up the water column. It pushes warm water downward, cold water upward, and so you get this mixing and stirring, and what happens is all the cold water here, all that dark blue, is removed from the water column. It's mixed out because of that heat that's been pushed down. And so you're left with a bottom water column here that's about four degrees warmer, four degrees Celsius warmer than before Michael, uh, Tropical Storm Gordon came through. So we've basically just pushed a whole bunch of heat down lower into the water column. 
Okay, great. What does that mean? Well, we'll see what that means shortly. Shortly after this is when that second heat content event, that, that second warming event occurred, right? So this is the first one. This is the second one. So we get this, this other increase in heat content happening in mid-February. And so what's going on there? Well, what's going on there is an atmospheric heat wave. So if we look at the data from uh, one st regional station, the, the other regional stations are, are consistent with this one. We see the same sort of structure. Time, uh, air temperature, not water temperature in this case. So this is air temperature. And we see the mean two standard deviations and the dashed black line is the maximum value observed. And the red is the observed value in 2018. And what you can see is the black, excuse me, the red and the black dashed line are overlapping here. They're overlapping here again. And so we have this extreme temperature condition happening. We have this extreme heat wave in mid-September and late September. And so we have a significant marine heat wave going on. So what does that do? Well, it, 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 it rapidly warms the upper ocean. So if we go back to our plot of temperature, right? So again, this is temperature throughout the water column, right? At zero meters to 20 meters time. And if we focus in on this mid-September period when that heat wave was going on, you see this significant rewarming, this intense rewarming of the upper ocean, right? So now we have tropical storm, st tropical storm Gordon pushing heat downward, right? So we have no cold water on the bottom and we have this rewarming of the upper ocean. And so we're left with this really, really warm water column, right? So this is the energy that st tropical storms love and, and feed off of, right? And so we now have this, this coupled process, a tropical storm followed by a uh, atmospheric heat wave amplifying water column conditions so that we then generate an extreme ocean event, a marine heat wave in the ocean prior to the landfall of Hurricane Michael, right? So this generates two natural questions. The first question is the coupling, right? So I've sort of suggested this through the, the observations, right? But we want to try to model this, um, right? So is the coupling of um, events, right, of storm mixing event followed by an atmospheric heat wave critical to the observed heat content, the excessive heat content we saw in the ocean, right? And so what do I mean by is the coupling important? Well, if we remove the mixing event, if we just had um, an atmospheric heat wave, would we get to the same heat content in the upper ocean that we got to? Or is that mixing event critical? Is that, that pushing of heat downward critical to generating this marine heat wave, this extreme ocean event? And then the second question, which I sort of touched on already, is what is what we're seeing at the mooring, right? We're over here uh, at Dolphin Island. The mooring's pretty far to the west of where Michael made landfall. Is what's happening at the mooring relevant to what, where Michael made landfall? And so we'll touch on that as well. So tackling the first question, what we can do is we can use a numerical model. We can take the data that we have for the surface forcing and apply it to the ocean with and without mixing, right? With and without that storm event, right? So if we look at that, right? So we can take the model. These are the observed temperature conditions from the mooring. And if we run a 1D model with the same heat forcing, we can do a pretty good job of matching up what the observed temperature looks like relative to the model temperature, right? And it's particularly good after the mixing event. So after it mixes, the model temperature looks a lot like the observed temperature, and so we're doing pretty well. And, and yeah, I'm qualitatively telling you this, but we can quantify that. And so if we look at sort of the depth average temperature, so if we take a, the column of water and depth average it and get one point each time step, we can plot that out, right? So this is sort of a depth average metric. So it's taking the vertical structure and just averaging it and then plotting it over time, right? So we have time here, August to October, and then we have depth average temperature here from 25 C to about 30 C. And then we have these different lines. The black line is the observed depth average temperature, right? The, the colored lines are model data, right? And so we want the model, ideally we want the model to be doing the same thing as the black line. And what you can see is none of them do exactly the same idea, do the exact same thing as, as the observed, right? And that's not totally surprising, right? So there's a great quote by George Box, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful, right? So what we're gonna try to do is take the useful portion of some of these models, right? And what we're gonna focus in on is the period after the mixing event happens. So after Tropical Storm Gordon comes through, if we look at just after this event, 
what we can see is this red line does a really good job of capturing the black line. It's just offset by a few degrees, right? So the fluctuations are very accurate. We're looking at an R value of 0.84. Um, and so this, this red model does a really good job of capturing post-tropical storm temperature dynamics. So now we're going to use that, and we're going to give one run, a, we're going to give one model run a storm, and we're going we're to just let one model run have no storm, so it's going to remain stratified. So that's what you're going to see next. Oh. Oh, I didn't show that. Okay, well, that's what you would see. I apologize, I did not put that in this, this, um, <laughs> this, this second slide. Um, so um, what you're seeing here is the, the depth average value of those model runs, right? So I don't have the image of those model runs, but I do have the depth average plot of those model runs. And so what you're seeing here is um, model runs with black, red, and blue, right? And so we have time. This is September 7th to October, uh, to October 7th. Again, this is depth average temperature. And so the black and the blue are model runs with storms, right? So you have that mixing effect. And the red plot here is a model run where you don't have the storm. And so if you play this out, so if you, if you, if you run the model over the duration of the month of September into early October, right before Michael, what you see is that the blue and the black lines are significantly different than the red line, right? So there's about a one degree difference between the blue and the black. The blue and the black, right, have storm events. The red doesn't have a storm event. So what this tells you is there's a one degree difference between the two. And one degree doesn't sound like much, but in the hurricane world, a one degree temperature difference does have a significant influence on how strong a storm is going to be. And so this is a notable difference, and it tells us that that mixing event was really important to the generation of a really high temperature field prior to Hurricane Michael. We can play some other games with the model. Um, I'm not going to get into too much detail here. Um, this top plot here just shows you if we change the, the depth and hydrographic structure, how does, how does with and without a storm change things? And what, you, what, what the idea here is, again, this is time versus temperature. This in this case is temperature difference. And what you can see is the temperature difference between with and without a storm can vary between 0.5 and 1 degree C. So it's a pretty consistent thing. You play around with some variables and you still get a similar effect. There's a significant difference between having a storm and not having a storm. So to answer our first question, is this coupling of events, is this storm followed by a marine heat wave critical to getting this extreme marine heat wave? The answer is yes, right? Um, and so the next question we want to answer is how relevant is what we're seeing at the mooring site to the broader Mississippi bite, right? So the mooring is right here. Hurricane Michael came ashore here. How relevant is what we're seeing here to where Michael made landfall, right? And we can do this in a couple ways, right? So right off the bat, this is a satellite image of sea surface temperature anomalies. Um, and what you can see is there's a lot of bright red all over this area. And so right off the bat, this gives us an idea that we have this marine heat wave happening at our site, and that's consistent with satellite sea surface temperature data suggesting that the whole area is on fire. The whole area is well above normal conditions. The whole area is experiencing a marine heat wave at the surface, right? Um, so we're, we're seeing an atmospheric heat wave. Um, we can also look at storm tracks, as I mentioned. So the next, the next question here is, is the mixing event important? So we see that there is a marine heat wave going over the whole area. Is this mixing event that pushes heat down to depth relevant for what we're seeing over here where Michael came ashore? Um, and, and we have the two storms paired up together. You can see they both sort of cover their cloud coverage and their storm area covers the same area. So that's suggestive of the fact that they're probably um, interacting over the same area. We can get a little bit more precise. We can look at, again, satellite data of before and after the storm. So these plots are differences. So if you take a satellite image of sea surface temperature and you subtract it from what's happening after the storm, so before and after, that you're going to see, a, you may see a change, right? And if there's mixing, what you would expect to see in sea surface temperature, if you mix cold water up, you'd expect the surface waters to get colder. You'd also expect them to get saltier because bottom water tends to have more salt. And so what you see in these two satellite images is the difference between 
before and after sea surface temperature and before and after sea surface salinity. And in this case, blues indicate colder water at the surface. Reds indicate saltier water to surface. And so you see colder and saltier water all in this coastal area, which is indicative of mixing over this entire area. So that's suggestive that Hurricane Gordon is in fact mixing a broad area. And so the stuff we're seeing, the, the information we're getting at our mooring is probably relevant to where Michael came ashore. We also have one more line of evidence. There's one station here uh, that we can compare our mooring data to. So if we take our mooring data and compare it to a, um, a, a surface, sea surface temperature measurement at, Pens uh, at Panama Beach City Fishing Pier, um, we can see, again, this is sea surface temperature, August to October. The red is Dolphin, I uh, the red is, uh, Dolphin Island Sea Lab. Oh, excuse me, the red is Panama Beach City. The purple is um, Dolphin Island Sea Lab. And you can see the purple and the red overlap. So they're doing very similar things. Um, I also have on the, the long-term patterns. And what you can see here is at Pensacola Beach, the long-term patterns are consistent with a marine heat wave. The red line and the black dash line are overlapping each other. So you do have a marine heat wave going on at that site. So it's pretty consistent with what we're seeing at, with the mooring. So we have several lines of evidence that suggest um, what we saw at the mooring site is reflective of what probably was happening where Hurricane Michael went to shore. So to answer the second question here, um, I've sort of done that already here. Yes, what we're seeing at the mooring is likely happening where Hurricane Michael came to shore. Okay, so let's pull all this together. What does this all mean, right? So what we've done here is we've identified a new way to generate a marine heat wave, right? So this is a, a coupled sequence of events that leads to an extreme environmental condition, right? So we have, this is sort of a graph that sort of shows you what's going on. You have your normal summertime conditions. The black line is your temperature structure where you have warm temperatures at the surface, colder temperatures at depth. And there's a strong picnic line here that separates the two. You have a storm come through. It mixes cold water up, so that drops your sea surface temperature, your upper ocean temperature, and it pushes warm water down, so it warms your bottom temperatures, and so you get this homogenized temperature structure. But that is significantly warmer at the bottom, right? And so that bottom temperature, basically, is this the cold water reserve has now been removed from the shelf, right? Then you get an atmospheric heat wave, right? That's that arrow coming in here. You get an atmospheric heat wave that's ramping up your upper ocean temperatures, right? So now you have warmer than average bottom temperatures, amplified upper ocean temperatures, and you have this really big block of heat content over the continental shelf, right? And so this is sort of a new series of events um, that can generate a, a marine heat wave. And so the, the next question is, well, why do we care about this? Well, I kind of mentioned some of that early on, but we'll just sort of rehash some of that, right? So coastal management, right? This is important for coastal management. Um, clearly, this relates to Hurricane Michael and storm amplification, right? So if, if you're a storm forecaster and you're, you see a baby storm come through, and there's a, that is likely going to push heat downward on the continental shelf. And if there's a subsequent warm period, you might have conditions on the shelf that would be likely to amplify a storm as it's coming to shore, right? So this could give some forewarning or give some predictive power to forecasters. Um, the other sort of aspect of coastal management is that this is pumping heat down to depth, right? And so if you think about coastal environments, things like hypoxia, coral reefs, right? These guys are stressed ecosystems that heat doesn't help, right? So coral bleaching is associated with really, wa really warm events. Hypoxia is associated with really warm events. You, you're amplifying the um, biogeochemical prof processes by upping temperatures, right? So if you're creating, a, if you have a new mechanism to create marine heat waves, um, if you're a if you're a um, ecologist or a conservation biology uh, biologist, um, this is a process that can generate an extreme heat wave that could stress your ecosystem. And as I mentioned, um, this is coral bleaching and or hypoxia prone shells. Why else might we care about this? Climate change, right? So if we think about the mechanisms that are driving this compounding event, right? It's a tropical storm, right? And what do we know about tropical storms in future climates? Well, they're gonna be more severe and they're gonna be getting 
broader in the area in which they affect, right? So as the climate warms, these tropical storms are going to influence wider range of area, and they're going to become more intense. So item one here is going to be amplified. What's the second component that causes this event to happen? Atmospheric heat waves. What do we know about atmospheric heat waves going into the future? They're going to be getting more severe, longer, more frequent. So in terms of atmospheric heat waves, they're going to be amplifying and becoming more severe. And so the two components of this mechanism that drives this marine heat wave are going to be amplifying in a warmer climate with global, with global climate change, with global warming. Um, and so we would expect this compound event to be more severe and more common going into the future. And so, um, yeah, it's something to pay attention to. Uh, and with that, I'd just like to thank my um, funding sources, uh, NOAA Restore Program, um, also sort of the NOAA Regional Collaborative Network, um, and a big shout out to Tech Support. They're the guys that keep this morning running, um, and it's been going for a really long time, and it is just a fabulous data set to work with. And so thank you, Tech Support. Uh, and with that, I take questions, but I can't communicate with you. So what we'll do is post your questions, and maybe I'll, I'll get into the chat room and sort of uh, try to answer some of your questions online if you happen to have them. Uh, thank you. Have a great Ocean Day. <laughs>